I'm Earl Taylor, Chief Marketing Officer at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, nonprofit MSI serves as the bridge between marketing theory and business practice, and our goal is to move the needle on significant marketing problems. We do this by funding research by leading academics worldwide on topics voted by our 70-plus corporate sponsors and disseminating that research through members-only events and a variety of publications. I'm very pleased to welcome you to another MSI for Members by Members webinar. This is a series of webinars on subjects related to MSI's current research priority topics. First, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have for Catherine and Jerry during the presentation. We'll gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speakers. Jerry Wend is Lauder Professor and Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School, and Catherine Hayes is Executive Director of the Wharton Future of Advertising Program, and they've kindly agreed to present today's webinar on their book, Beyond Advertising, Creating Value Through All Customer Touchpoints. Uh, just a brief biographical background about each. Uh, Jerry is founding director of the Wharton SEI Center for Advanced Studies and Management. Uh, he was also uh, helped create the Future of Advertising program and co-founder of the Wharton Reimagine Education program. He's led efforts there to uh, develop their global programs, to reinvent the Wharton MBA, and to create a Wharton Executive MBA program. He has edited virtually all of the top marketing journals in his career, published over 250 articles and 20 books, won numerous academic awards, and consulted with over 100 companies. And we're especially pleased to note that uh, Jerry was one of the scholars that MSI began supporting early in our career, in his career, uh, and he has served as a former academic trustee of MSI, so we're very pleased to have Jerry here today. And equally pleased to have Catherine Hayes, who's the Executive Director of the Wharton Future of Advertising, program where she helped establish uh, the program of Wharton's think tank, the SEI Center for Advanced Studies and Management. She has blown the global advisory board to over 90 thought leaders from around the world and enlisted 200 visionaries to contribute it to the Advertising 2020 project that you'll be hearing about in a moment. Uh, she's conducted numerous roundtable insights discussions with executives around the world, uh, and she is also co-host of the Marketing Matters radio show on business radio powered by the Wharton Schools. Sirius XM 111 uh, channel. That's Wednesdays 5 to 7 Eastern time if you would care to listen in on that. Uh, so with that, uh, and I should mention that Catherine comes to us also with a background in marketing and sales at AT&T where she worked with uh, numerous clients of AT&T prior to her academic career at Wharton. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Jerry and Catherine to do the presentation and then we'll come back uh, towards the end for some good Q&A. Thanks. It's a delight to be here and uh, to share with you the key findings of our uh, study and latest book. Uh, the objective of the session is really briefly to discuss the findings of the World and Future of Advertising program and to explore the implication to advertising, marketing, your organization, and business strategy in general. Uh, the base for the book uh, is primarily uh, an assembly of uh, the insight from over 200 thought leaders from around the world who answered two simple questions. What could or should advertising look like in 2020? And what should we do now for that future? So it's not asking them what will advertising be to try to forecast it, but rather their ideal view of ad what advertising could or should look like in 2020. Uh, the first finding was uh, primarily that all recognized the in incredible importance of the five forces of change that include primarily dramatic changes in science and technology. Just imagine, for example, what would be the impact of uh, having uh, every one of your competitors, every one of your clients have access to Watson. Uh, or think about the implication of uh, the Internet of Everything uh, or the impact of the ability to personalize everything. Uh, the second is the redefined media landscape. And just think about how, you know, your use of uh, social media and how this is changing almost daily. And then the most powerful kind of uh, component of the force of change is really the, what's happening to the skeptical and empowered consumers. Um, 
And uh, that's not a new phenomenon. We actually uh, discovered some of the skeptical in part consumers in the study we did in, in 2000. But uh, whatever we found then, consumers who want to uh, primarily get more personalization, want to primarily be part of communities, wanted to uh, be able to call, click, and visit, be able to um, have better value for their money, and be able to get better tools to help them make better decisions. These are now on steroids, and they're really kind of uh, increasing and changing the, the environment, especially given the way they, they can and have access to all the technology. Uh, the fourth is all the changes in the cultural, social, geopolitical environment, the competitive environment, the way the competitive environment is changing dramatically, but also at the same time issues such as the digital divide and the economic divide that we have, that we clearly see it reflected in the current elections. And the fifth one is a whole set of new business and revenue models that are being emerging uh, given the fact that um, I mean, most companies realize they cannot just continue doing the same thing they've done before. The status quo is not a viable option in today's environment. And I think everyone keeps in mind the fact that uh, of the Fortune 500 in 1955, there are only 12% that are still on the Fortune 500 today. Uh, and everyone is concerned about uh, the, the challenge of being Uberized or kind of basically uh, a new con competitor from outside the industry destroying basically the industry and them. So this has huge implications, and we tried primarily to look in terms of so what are the implications of this to uh, marketing and advertising. Uh, the first implication that, uh, that we kind of uh, – we're looking at is primarily the need to challenge venal miles, and it primarily was driven by the fact that most organizations felt they are not prepared uh, to deal with these forces of change. Uh, this is a study that IBM did two years back, and on the right side you see the slide that uh, most CMOs felt that uh, the factors impacting marketing include the data explosion, social media, growth of channel device. Uh, choices, decreasing brand loyalty, all the factors that you're familiar with. But the scary thing is the vertical dimension that shows that between 60 and 70% of the respondents felt that their companies are underprepared for dealing with this. And the situation today in 2016 is not much better. You know, kind of on the left side, there are basically the progress that has been made in a number of areas like data explosion, the rise of social, increasing complexity of marketing uh, between um, uh, 2013 and 15, and you see that uh, while there have been improvements, still the majority of companies, over 50% of companies, are just not there. They are not ready to deal with this. So the question is, so what should we do about it? So we we thought that the first and most important thing to do is we have to change the mental models of advertising and marketing. Um, I will not go into great depth into the men, what mental models are. We, you know, you're all familiar with them. I looked at the list of participants here, and hi to all my friends there. Uh, but uh, primarily, you know, if you think about, I'll use one example for kind of explaining the mental models. Think about uh, inner city. Would you invest in inner city? Most of you probably would say no, because the the image will be inner cities full of crime, drug, poverty. Uh, but then if the question is, would you invest in emerging markets? Well, the typical response we get is yes, because emerging markets are just opportunities. So what if we change the name of inner city from, um, uh, instead of calling it inner city, we'll call this emerging domestic market. Well, emerging domestic market is still the same level of crime, drug, poverty as inner city, but a lot of people are willing to invest in it because the mental model of this is of opportunities. There are tons of other examples of this. You're familiar with my book on uh, the power of impossible thinking that discusses this topic. But just think for a minute about all the breakthrough innovations that we have on the screen now. And when you look at them and ask yourself what is common to them, then it's obviously that what's common is the fact that every one of them changed the male model of their industries. And the question to all of you on uh, the line here you know, reflect on your own company and to what extent you were able to change the model of your industry and uh, would you qualify to be on a board with uh, the company such as the one that you see. Uh, so the key point basically is that in a changing environment, as we discussed before, the five forces of change, 
uh, challenging and potentially changing the male mouth is a must. And Einstein said in the most articulate way, without changing our pattern of thoughts, we will not be able to solve the problem we created with our current pattern of thoughts. So given this, um, reflect for a second in what are your mental models of advertising and should you challenge them uh, and ideally even change them. So um, my concern is that our concern here in, in the project has been uh, the situation of the king that we see here. He was fighting a war with swords and spears. Someone came with a little better uh, kind of weapon, this machine gun, but the king says, no, I can't be bothered to see some crazy self, and we've got a battle to fight. Uh, so in terms of advertising, what we did is primarily we broke it down into the traditional kind of um, model of the who, what, where, when, why, and uh, how, and uh, try to examine what do we have it today, what is the current male model, like in who, for example, the marketer and agencies through media target demographics, but the, uh, what it should be, basically, if you think about the kind of the advertising would like to be by 2020, would like it to be really cross silo collaborators of all the people involved here, uh, consumers, clients, employees, and others, and just think about even the traditional distinction that we have between employees and clients. Uh, is it still valid? You know, kind of uh, think about Facebook. Who are the ones who produce all the materials? You know, the, the billion six uh, uh, consumers of Facebook, you know, aren't they really behaving like employees or in any one or the hundreds of thousands of developers of apps for, for Apple? You know, they're not employees, but are they really traditional type of uh, outsiders? So the whole definitions are changing, and we have to start thinking about basically in terms of how do we reach effectively all of the people involved here. In terms of the what, how do we move from the traditional ads to orchestrated value creation touch points? And we'll talk about touch points in a minute, but it's primarily the whole notion of how do we create value here and not just focusing on ads. In terms of the when, as opposed to traditional frequency, why not focus on when needed, wanted, appreciated? In terms of where, instead of the traditional reach, why not focus on where needed, wanted, appreciated? Instead of why, instead of just push and persuade for sales and basically lead consumers to try to use ad blockers more and more because they hate it, why not change it to multi-win outcomes to all involved? And in terms of the how, as opposed to just focusing on ad campaigns, why don't we focus on all initiatives in a holistic dynamic ecosystem? So if you look at all these kind of the new memo model that we're proposing, and that's outlined here, and you'll see it in, if you get hold of the book, Beyond Advertising, you'll see it elaborated there. Uh, we're suggesting a pretty dramatic change in the memo model of advertising. This also calls for a change in the vocabulary of advertising. We're moving away from, for example, from advertising campaign to think about value creation initiatives or moving from big data to actionable insights and the like. So start thinking about not only in terms of the male model you have, but also in terms of the vocabulary we're using to try to communicate with each other because it's a huge difference between focus on uh, success or failure, for example, as opposed to learning. Uh, while these are not necessarily the absolutely right terms, I think the direction we're suggesting here to start thinking about the new vocabulary needed is quite important. So the question is, what are the implications of these new mental models on advertising? And the model we're proposing is an old touch point model that has five components. One is align the need to align the objective for multi-win outcomes, both with short and long-term impact. And here we're talking about basically the objective of the brand, the people involved, and the culture, society, and the world. Know that we're talking about people and not consumers because we'd like to be able to deal with people in many roles and not only in the role of consumers. And we're talking about also the third dimension of culture, society, and the world because increasingly the millennials especially are interested in companies with a mission and with a purpose and not just you know, another you know, company out there. Um, the result of this aligned objective ideally will be able to develop a compelling unifying brand purpose that is being designed by combining the four forces on the side, the analytical brilliance, operational brilliance, creative brilliance, and design brilliance. Once we have a compelling unifying brand uh, purpose, 
then the heart of the mal is really the ability to deliver it. And I'll skip the examples here. Uh, we may want to go back to them at the, the Q&A, or you may be able to look at them at the book if you're interested. I would like really to go pretty fast so we can have time for real interaction with many of my friends in the, in the audience here. The third and the, kind of the most uh, kind of important really aspect of the, kind of the new way of looking at advertising is that we cannot really limit our way of thinking just to the media, not even the new media. We really have to think about all touch points a consumer has with the brand. Uh, product design, package design, store design, call center interaction, any touch point a consumer has with a brand is as important as advertising. Why are we focusing only on the subset of these when we're trying to deal with media mix? Huge implication, for example, to media mix optimization when you know that you're always suboptimal because you're missing all the other components, all the other touch points a consumer has with the brand. Uh, that's actually also the, the motivation behind the name of the, the book, the title, which is Beyond Advertising, because we have to think about all touch points. So once we identify we have the compelling brand uh, purpose that we're de delivering it to all touch points, so what will be the nature of the message? So we are suggesting here probably to follow the RAVES criteria. And RAVES not only in terms of you'll applaud what we're suggesting or the, the ad we're coming up with or the message we're coming up with, but really meeting the RAVES criteria, which stands for the R is for primarily being more respectful of the individual and relevant for them, and relevance is absolutely key. And respectful, just think about the advertising you're exposed to today and to what extent you feel that they are respectful of you. The A is primarily for actionable. The valuable and value generating will include both cognitive as well as emotional, and to the extent that using promotion, definitely will include then monetary. And keep in mind that most of the research suggests that the emotional is more powerful and important than the cognitive. Uh, the E stands for exceptional experience. And just think about what we know today in terms of the experience economy and the importance of designing experience and just compare the experience you have with the Apple Store compared to the typical type of retail experience. And the S stands for the shareworthy story. So it's not enough to have a story, which has been the tradition of advertising, but how do we basically motivate the consumers uh, to share it with others? So these are the kind of RAVES criteria. So assuming you're developing your messages, your advertising, your offering, following the RAVES criteria, it would be nice for you to, to examine, kind of use this almost as a self-assessment tool to what extent you are meeting the RAVES criteria. The question then is, and what is the context in which we're presenting it? And here is another acronym uh, that we used, and this will be MADES. And the M stands for primarily for uh, multi-sensory, and the example you have here, if you're not familiar with this, is uh, primarily why wake up to the traditional kind of alarm clock? Why not wake up to the smell of bacon? Uh, or, you know, kind of a smell of coffee or anything else that you prefer. But the idea here is start using multi-sensory. The audience, we're really talking about way, way beyond and above the traditional demographic and psychographic and try to take advantage of the fact that a consumer today is an integral part of uh, basically cannot separate the consumer for, for the mobile device from the smartphone they're with. And you can therefore reach a consumer at any point of time. You can continuously know what are they communicating, what they're thinking about in terms of their communication with the social networks. So we really talk about a much deeper understanding of the audience they're moved at any given point of time in real time. The D stands for the delivery mechanism, the multi-screen, the devices we're using, but also other delivery approaches. The E is for the environment or the traditional editorial context that we used to call. And the S is for the synergy that we have among uh, the different uh, touch points. And how do we create the synergy then of the messages we have across touch points? So again, another set of criteria to evaluate the context in which you are presenting the material. So if we look at this, the question then, uh, so what are the implications? So think about what we just discussed in terms of the various components of the model and the implication to you, marketing, and your organization. And because of our focus on all touch points, uh, we're definitely moving way, way beyond advertising. We're moving beyond marketing because even think about marketing, 
How many CMOs you're familiar with, or if you one of them on the, the list here, do you have control of what we have been teaching for years in terms of the four Ps? Most CMOs don't have control over the product, don't have control over the price, don't have control over the placement, especially in a B2B environment where it's primarily by the sales force, and you have some control over the brand and the advertising. So, but if we're talking about the need to focus on all touch point integration, we're really talking here the need to think almost rethinking the business strategy, uh, dealing with the head of the business unit or the CEO and the like. Uh, so the question is how do we implement it? So primarily the way to implement it is we're suggesting three things. The most important is experimentation. And let me take a minute to explain the adaptive experimentation here. So imagine you spend X millions of dollars in advertising and you go to the response we, that we see here. Uh, what should you do next? Should you increase your advertising, decrease it, or keep it the same level? The reality, if you're following the, our kind of little discussion here, is we don't know. The answer is I don't know. And when you reflect on what does it mean, I don't know, it means you just wasted a whole year because they invested all these millions of dollars in advertising and you're no smarter at the end of the year than you were at the beginning of the year. So the way to avoid this uh, embarrassing situation is to design a simple experiment where you have basically in some market X, some market 2X, some market half X. And then depending on the results, if the results are primarily X, the next year continue with level X and start experimenting with other things, the content, the positioning, and the like. If the results are the Xs that we have here, the next year continue and experiment with 3X, 4X, see how far can you push it. And if the results are the blocks that we have here, the next year experiment with 3X and perhaps a quarter X and see what happens. Are you able to move the needle here? Uh, it's only experimentation, and especially not only in a simple experiment like this with one variable, but we start dealing with uh, more complex experiments. And that's still relatively simple Latin square design here. Uh, you can basically get the benefit of experimentation, which provides it's the only way to actually establish causal link between what you're doing and the results. It is therefore leading you to make better decisions. Uh, given the fact you're making better decisions here, you'll get all type of kind of better outcomes uh, and will allow you continuous learning. And uh, to try to do experiments, you have to have measures. So the traditional problem that we have in advertising, which most managers complain, they don't know what is the ROI on advertising, now we can basically answer the question because it forces measurement. But two other most important characteristics of the experimentation is this is probably the best way for you to create a culture of innovation in your organization. Because the minute uh, you are experimenting and send a message, we would like to experiment, everyone knows not every experiment will succeed. So you're sending it, it basically a per, not like giving permission to everyone in the organization to start uh, taking risk and then focus on lessons from failure, not necessarily try to avoid taking any risk. And finally, the other key benefit of experimentation, is, especially if you have more complex experiments, is that you're confusing the competition. They can see the, the, what you're doing, they can see the results, but they cannot link the two because they don't have the master design that we have here. So our first suggestion is to actually focus on experimentation as a way of implementing, because we really don't know based on the model we suggested. We cannot tell you specifically what type of message to design or execute, what type of uh, portfolio of touch points, but that's where you want basically following our guidelines to start experimenting. And we're coming to experimentation, we suggest that you really focus on a portfolio of experiments. And we're kind of adapting here the, uh, the traditional uh, innovation horizon model, but focus more than just on the innovation, but focus on business model, the offering, technology, and the like. And think about this in terms of the current, existing in the world, but you don't do it and new to the world. And the same thing with respect to markets, current, existing to the world, and new. And the idea will be that as you design experiments, start designing them for all three innovation horizon here. Uh, you may want uh, probably to allocate the majority of the resources, say 80 or 90 percent, to the current and start experimenting within this. But you may want also to move into other areas and experiment with uh, more bold and innovative experiments. For example, experiments utilizing Watson uh, may be in the uh, the second or third area. Experiments involving wearable computing uh, can be in another area. 
So a variety of other kind of um, way out some of the new development, especially in virtual reality and, and augmented reality. Uh, the technology is already here. Why won't we start experimenting? What is their impact on advertising and the like? So once we design this experiment, the big challenge is we'll be able to implement this within our current organization. And in our experience, we see that to try to implement effectively a strategy of adaptive experimentation, we really have to start playing with the different elements of the organizational architecture. So here is a simplistic view of the organizational architecture. Once I have a mission and kind of uh, the, both the long-term value creation and uh, an objective of the organization, the elements will be the culture and value, the governance and business model, the structure and processes, value creation, the people, the competencies we have, the, uh, the physical and virtual facilities, the resources, technology, and most important, the performance metrics uh, and uh, the dashboard that we have and what are the incentives we provide people. So what changes do we have to make to these elements of the organization architecture that will allow us to implement effectively a strategy of adaptive experimentation? And keep in mind, we talk about adaptive experimentation. It's not just a little A-B testing a little bit before I'm going to launch a kind of my campaign. It means consistently uh, and continuously experimenting with new innovative approaches. Uh, part of this is because we're talking about the need to deal with all touch points will be to try to design experiments, not only in terms of the content of advertising, but also in terms of how do we overcome the different silos that we have, whether the, the silos with, among the different touch points, and we're kind of listing here, and the, the book discussed in much greater de detail, the kind of the deadly dozen silos that effective organization um, requires to try to address. Now, I'm not suggesting to eliminate the silos because you do need the in-depth expertise of each one of the silos, but we have to bridge across the silos so we can get the benefit of the integrated approach, and in our case, especially the, the benefit of uh, uh, all touch point uh, integration. Uh, now, the other element when we start talking about uh, the, the organization capabilities and be ready to deal with uh, the changes in the environment and implement uh, the model we're suggesting is to adopt open innovation. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that the fifth force of change is new business models and revenue models. One of the major new business models uh, that we're dealing with today is open innovation. Uh, I hope you're all familiar with this. Um, I'll, let me just kind of uh, quote kind of the, one of the findings from Innocenti, uh, who found that they have a, a network of over a quarter of a million uh, problem solvers, and when major companies give them problems that they cannot solve internally, and this typically R&D type problems, uh, they found out that the further the discipline of the problem solver from the discipline of the problem, the higher the likelihood of success, which means if they're getting a medical problem, it's not the medical experts who are going to solve it. Uh, this has huge implication because it basically suggests no company is large enough, rich enough to be able to hire people in all disciplines, which means that any one of your strategies should include not only hiring the needed competencies, but also connecting to the needed competencies outside. And in the advertising sphere, we have a company actually that specializes in this area, Victor and Spoils. They have a network of over 7,000 creatives. So you can actually utilize not only the creatives of a given agency, but actually go to create a very large network of uh, creatives and leverage them. Or create uh, your own competition, like a, the Netflix Prize, which was an open competition, but you can do it obviously in the advertising marketing area. So if you look at all this, we basically uh, suggest that the other component that we have to deal with is not only the experimentation, and not only playing with the different elements of the organization architecture, but also start creating and leveraging the networks. And let me share with you here in about two minutes uh, another recent study we've done by Center, and this is primarily examining the business models of over 1,500 companies. Uh, both um, the very large one, the middle, mid-size, and small. And we found out that they have basically only four business models that drive all these 1,500 companies. Either you're an asset builder, like manufacturer or retailer, or service provider, like consulting firm, 
technology creator like software developer or pharmaceutical companies, and network orchestrator like Uber, Airbnb, Visa, MasterCard, and some of the other networks we have. Then we ask the question, what is the market value as a multiple of revenues of these companies? And what we found is that asset builders is one, service provider is two, technology creator is four, and network orchestrator is eight plus. Obviously, you know, kind of you want to be in the upper kind of uh, uh, category here above the digital divide, either technology or the network. Uh, but we found this that actually less than you know, kind of uh, very few companies, less than two percent, are network orchestrators. But every company, especially even if you are asset builder, service provider, or technology creator, you have networks. You have network of customers, of employees, of investors, of suppliers, of, dis of distributors, and others. And the question for you then is how can you leverage those networks? And our belief is primarily that by using RML and using primarily the old touch point uh, orchestra orchestration approach, uh, following the raves and maids mal, uh, we you will be able to start leveraging and activating these networks that you have. So this is basically the third uh, kind of um, aspect of the mal that primarily focuses on how do we go to implement it. You have the entire model here. So again, uh, just as a review, forces of change leading to challenging the mental models, aligning the objectives, coming up with a compelling unified brand purpose, delivering it through all touch points, using raves and maids as the criteria for the content and the context, and implementing through experimentation, and then primarily by leveraging the elements of the organizational architecture and the network we are involved with. So that's our model. What I would love to do now is basically to ask you, so what are the implications of this? And open this to any questions, and hopefully uh, we'll get Catherine to join us in responding to some of the questions. So Earl, back to you. Okay, thanks, Sherry. That was great. Uh, it's obviously a lot of thought, a lot of input to that uh, framework for the decision making, and I would urge those of you who are on the uh, webinar today to check, the, check out the book. It's a, it's a great guide to the very kinds of questions you need to be asking yourself and examples of where this has worked. Uh, since you were presenting kind of the overall framework and the challenging questions and a little bit of how to respond, I'm hoping maybe that you and Catherine both can give us some examples uh, in response to some of the questions that we have. Uh, and I want to come back to something you said uh, towards the end of your overview, Jerry, and that is the need to connect all of the touch points, not just advertising, hence the title of the book, but the challenge that most CMOs and people in marketing, which I suspect is the bulk of our audience today, uh, face because, as you pointed out, they don't control all those touch points. So maybe from the roundtables that Catherine conducted and some of the interviews that you all did, uh, examples of where people have found a champion that leads this. Is it the CEO? Uh, does the CMO in some cases have the power to, to really orchestrate across touch points? A little bit more maybe about how people actually succeed in doing some of those things. Terrific. Catherine, do you want to take it? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at it. Um, and, and you can all understand why, why we had Jerry go through it because he goes a mile a minute. So we do hope that there's some, uh, some questions uh, that, that help us to clarify, um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so one of the things that, to, that, we've ha that we've seen especially is that opportunities when there's a rebranding opportunity or as, as uh, organizations are seeing these forces of change that Jerry outlined at the outset and the real need to have to rethink their whole organization, it becomes a really perfect opportunity for this kind of collaboration across the different silos. And so um, what we've seen is with chief marketing officers, there's some really interesting partnerships um, that are emerging. So one of them is with the HR department. And they're really seeing that they sort of start from within to ensure that um, the employee body, uh, that they're not only just um, communicating with them, but tapping into them to really understand what's the essence of the organization, because the organization is the people of the organization and the company are really what the core is, and that's where the authenticity comes from. So that's, that's one of the key collaborations before there's anything external. Um, and the second one that I know we've, we've heard about for a while but is strengthening is with the chief information officer, the CIO. 
Um, but that is really coming across very, very strongly, and that's one of the reasons why we included this notion of operational excellence, because in order to make this happen, in order to um, have the analytics be operational, uh, that you really have to be coordinating between the insights that are coming out of the marketing department and the, the listening that's happening um, with customers and people, uh, and connecting that throughout the organization through the CIO function. If I may, yeah, let me, let me add uh, two other kind of perspectives on this. Uh, internally, we also find out that uh, there are some new titles, like Chief Customer Officer, and in some companies, the Chief Marketing Officer reports actually to the Chief Customer Officer, and the idea there is to try, or Chief Customer Experience Officer. So the whole idea is to try to focus on the customer, and this is leading us then better to better integration. The other and the one which is the most common kind of leader, if you want, or the orchestrator, is basically presidents of business units. They're the only one who really have control over all the, the touch points. And uh, the more innovative and successful presidents of business units, uh, they're really the, the one who do it effectively. And in smaller companies, this might be the, the founder of the small company or the CEO who takes this role. Now, the interesting development is that there are a number of outside small firms, startups, that are thinking or try to position themselves as they can become the orchestrator from the outside. Uh, so the, basically, we do have here kind of, in a sense, a fight for who is going to be the orchestrator. And uh, at this stage, it's not clear who is the winner. And I think it depends so much on the specific situation, the industry, the company, uh, and most importantly, you know, let me go back to what uh, Catherine started with when she talked about rebranding. I'll make it a little broader and say whenever a company is in crisis, it's probably the best time to try to do it because the reality is that successful companies are reluctant to take risk. They're uh, too captives of the status quo. Uh, Jerry, that's a great transition to the next question I was going to ask, which goes back to your comments about experimentation. And again, both of you might have examples of what you heard from the many companies and executives that you spoke to. Uh, you make the excellent point that it creates uh, the right kind of culture of innovation uh, where you can learn from failure. And yet I know we've heard from our own members in various forums that uh, not many organizations are willing to kind of stick their necks out that far. Maybe managers just don't see the, the rewards and the career path that's being encouraged to do that. So maybe just a little bit more about specifically how do you inculcate that experimentation, that culture of innovation. Uh, and then a related question that's come up is, and you mentioned at the outset, uh, you know, uh, the established companies want to avoid being Uberized, as you put it, so the question is, what are the advantages that, that incumbents have in this dynamic marketplace where they're being challenged by the Ubers and Airbnb? So you know, uh, maybe a little bit about how you can actually begin to create a culture of experimentation or risk taking, and where there may be advantages that incumbent companies actually have, whereas usually we hear about all the advantages that the attacker company has. Oh, great, great, great questions. Uh, Catherine, you want to start? You want me to start? Yeah, just, I mean, my, my initial thought is that we've, we've heard from a lot of companies, actually not just certainly the marketers, but also um, agencies, where they recognize they have to do this. And, and rather than trying to get everybody to change, they start with a skunk works or a small organization. They put it off to the side so that it doesn't get sucked back into the status quo. Um, they change the measurements, as Jerry was talking about. They change the incentive system. They, they really start from scratch. Um, they bring in different disciplines who are literally physically in the same place. They have researchers. They have um, customer analytics, they have cultural anthropologists. They have user uh, experience designers so that they're really thinking from the outset and from the, from the bottom up with this different kind of model where all the touch points come together rather than, you know, advertising and marketing sort of being the thing that you put on at the very end of it, that it's crafted together and it becomes very difficult to even see the distinction in the, between what is the marketing aspect of it versus what's the product design because it's, it's much more of a holistic approach. And then with that, as that success is coming, as those incentive systems are in place, sharing those successes. Um, and some people uh, that we've heard about do sort of rotations too. So you have a group of people who rotate in for 18 months through this and then back out into the organization to, to spread the, uh, the new way of thinking with um, the support system back, back in, the, 
in the incubator organization because uh, because sometimes they're called crazy. Great. Let, let me let me suggest a few additional kind of items here. So, when you think about um, try to convince uh, what I will call a legacy company to start experimenting with this. And incidentally, those who are interested in this, we just uh, published a paper on uh, innovation for legacy companies. So we'd love to send it to you if you're interested in this. But primarily, hopefully, you know, kind of the, the logic of experimentation that I described before and the benefits of this are so compelling. And if not, think about the, the examples. Companies like Google, Facebook, and others, they don't do anything without experimentation. Everything is a result of experimentation. It's continuous experimentation throughout their life. And uh, so that's one, one way. The other one is companies that realize they really don't have a choice. Um, I'll give you an example. Just before this webinar, I was on a call with uh, a company I am working with. They're a major uh, supply chain um, uh, company. And uh, we realized that primarily the accelerating change in retailing is so dramatic, so fast. Amazon is growing so fast and the like. Uh, that basically the plan that they had uh, will not succeed unless they start experimenting with totally new offering. Uh, so th this was basically I did an hour discussion with the CEO of the company, and primarily the whole focus was on what experiment should we start developing. And the experiments were really along the line that I suggested before in the presentation, along the three innovation horizon. And we then found about 10 different experiments that they can start kind of uh, exploring. Uh, now, the second question that you had in terms of uh, what can incumbents do, um, they, some of them are basically uh, going the route of acquisitions and trying to acquire basically small companies. Uh, the challenge there is primarily in the acquisition route is uh, the integration and how effective are they in integrating the acquired company with the traditional one. And typically the problem for effective integration is, is in the culture. The second thing that is, uh, seems to be very, very successful is for companies, and I, actually most of the high-tech companies, and in Israel there are like you know, 400 or plus uh, major high-tech companies from around the world, the Google, the Facebook, the IBM, and others, all of them are there, and most of them have basically internal accelerators. So they select a topic, announce an accelerator, it's about a three-month period to try to develop new businesses, new offering in this area. Uh, create global competition for this, select about nine external teams uh, to come and work internally in a space they create, and they may add one internal team to them. And the experience with this has been absolutely spectacular in terms of the results of the accelerators because these companies, by working together, by following almost the, the traditional approach of accelerators in terms of the mentoring and the help and the like, are really leading to new solutions. So I would recommend to any of the legacy companies online here uh, to start thinking about uh, creating your own accelerators, uh, use more open innovation, and if you're interested, you know, ask for our paper. We'd love to send it to you. That's great, Jerry. Thanks for that. Um, Diana has a question I think goes back to something you addressed earlier, and that is uh, could you give us an example of a company that you think is doing a good job of integrating the experience across all the touch points? Uh, if you can name the company, great. If not, at least kind of describe the category they're in and what they're doing to really connect across all those touch points. Catherine, you want to try? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, that's, that's certainly um, sort of the next challenge for us or the next opportunity is to reach back out to our community and, and all of those with whom we're speaking about the, the concepts of the book, gather together these kinds of examples. Obviously, that's what's going to be the most powerful for us in terms of learning. But um, one of the ones that we like to use is uh, Bonobos. Uh, and they're a company that was um, actually uh, the VP of marketing is a, is a Wharton alum, and we recently had him on, on the radio show. But they're they have really, again, sort of a new company that's in um, uh, menswear, uh, high fashion, but they really started it from the ground up, taking, um, starting from the experience of, of their customers, of their audience, and thinking of it all the way through and building the whole company around that experience. So just for example, their, um, their customer service, they've uh, really refined the way that they think about how they support their customer support team. They call them ninjas. And um, even though they have a Bible for how to be the best ninja customer support that they want, the first rule that they have is to go off script whenever it's 
needed to, to do exactly what they want to do. Um, their packaging is such that uh, the box that arrives in the mail actually looks like a briefcase. Uh, the flap flips up so that you can turn it into. And what they found is that people actually bring the boxes into their office to do the unpackaging. So they've actually created a whole customer experience about receiving it in the mail, unboxing it, taking pictures of it, sharing it with your friends, and, they're, um, and it's very share-worthy as we talk about. Um, their, their stores are, are bespoke in terms of how they do it, um, and all of their communications really has the same kind of feeling and vibe, so it's consistent throughout. Um, and there's a little bit more about it. Yeah, here's the example um, on that. Gary, others? I think it's a great example. Let, let me give you kind of three other kind of perspective on this. One is I would say that all the companies are moving effectively toward omni-channel, which is providing the consumer with a seamless experience, both online and offline, are at least moving in the right direction. Uh, you know, Warby Parker is an interesting example because they started online, but then they start now introducing stores. Uh, but primarily museums are doing some interesting work in terms of how do you basically create, uh, as you move toward digitization primarily of your activities, how do you basically uh, encourage people to interact with the museum online, but then encourage them to come to, to the museum. So the whole, every company that is trying in this area and experimenting, I think, can be an example and probably they will learn from this and uh, can be get their own lessons of how to do it better. The second area I would suggest is to look at Apple. Uh, Apple not only has spectacular kind of product design, but think about the experience you have in the Apple Store. Uh, it's a totally different type of experience that it created. So Apple, again, is an example to a whole set of companies that are primarily focusing on a more exciting customer experience. And the customer experience focusing on this leads almost by definition to the need to integrate some of the other touch points as part of it. And the third example I would like to come suggest here is what IBM is doing on the supply side. So IBM, you know, you're all familiar with what they're doing, but they're developing a huge new function which is primarily uh, in the digital interactive agency. So they buy agencies, they could basically develop internal capabilities in this area because they realize to try to help their clients, it's not enough to provide them let's, access to Watson and try to some of the, the benefit they get from this, but the real benefit will be to try to take it to the next level and execute this and provide integrated digital experience to the consumer. So I think you have this, and almost all of the large holding companies are now trying to uh, buy digital agencies. Everyone is buying uh, big data and analytic companies. And I think all of them are kind of good, good signs in terms of at least they realize the need for the new set of competencies and the challenges, how successful are they in integrating it. So, and here I don't think there is a kind of an option for companies not to start experimenting with different way of integrating the different type of capabilities that they are bringing together. That's great. Those are great examples. And I should point out, too, for the audience that Warby Parker was also started by Wharton Grad. So obviously they're learning some good lessons there uh, with you and Catherine. Um, I'm going to paraphrase a couple of questions we have that I think are related, and, and they sort of build on, on this notion of uh, the seamless experience across touch points. Uh, you hear a lot about you know, the impact of mobile, how that's changing consumer behavior, consumer decision making, uh, and some people are saying you know, we should now be going or think maybe change our mental model to mobile first. Uh, so that's sort of the first part of the question. But then maybe the, the flip side of that is with the ability to sort of intrude any point, any time, uh, you know, get our message out to the consumer, hyper-target just you know, the, the segment of one idea which has been talked about for years and now seems to be a reality, at least potentially, is there a possibility of overdoing that? Are, are we focusing too narrowly? Are we risk becoming too intrusive if we can sort of 24-7 target people and, and reach them on their mobile devices and so forth? So maybe a little bit of the cautionary notes about how to do that and, and maybe what not to do. That's a great topic, and it's one of Catherine's favorite kind of topics to discuss. So Catherine, I would not, not deprive you of the ability to respond <laughs> to this first. So the, the answer is, is there a risk, thank you, Jerry, is, is there, the question is, is there a risk of becoming too intrusive? And the answer is, is undeniably yes. 
And I think that we really heard that loudly and clearly from um, the contributors to the Advertising 2020 project. And it was at the very core, as they looked to the future, as they looked at 2020 and saw how all these technologies could come together, um, how much intelligence could be got, um, gathered, um, technology to understand voice recognition and what mood somebody's in and um, who else, how many other people are in the room. By, it is, there's a tremendous amount, and that's why we emphasize science and technology. So it, it really was a huge motivation for us and for the community to, to emphasize this notion of, of value creation, and hence the, the subtitle of the book and that the, the mental model for advertisers and marketers and corporations at that point of intersection with an individual should be all about value creation. And not even necessarily value exchange, right? Value creation and co-creation um, within the context of what's going on in culture and society um, so that it's having a net positive impact. Um, and we think that that's why you know, we put those two acronyms together, the RAVES and the MADE, because those are the two um, uh, essential elements, sort of the context, or what we're hoping people start to call substance, uh, context, excuse me, content, um, and sort of content marketing, really thinking about its substance, what is of value there, um, using the RAVES model. And then contextually, all of the ways, to your point, Earl, that companies can contextualize it through mobile devices, through geofencing, through geotargeting, through these other things, how to do that um, in a really relevant and respectful way. Um, and it's going to take some self-control because uh, um, you know, it's going to be easy to overstep the boundaries. But that's why we also emphasize the notion of empowered consumers. And I think the, some of the statistics that I've seen are about 23% um, in the North America uh, ad blocker uh, penetration. So, you know, there's going to be more. There's been more in terms of DVR to, to, to get rid of the bad stuff and to ignore it and to turn it off. Lots of ways to do that. So um, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's so, a great response. Uh, go ahead, Jerry, please. Let me try on the ad locker. I actually would like to take the position publicly that I welcome the ad blockers. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to the industry. Uh, and the dumbest thing the industry can do is try to block the ad blockers uh, because I think the ad blockers are basically the right of consumers said, you're, you're intruding, you're giving me new junk as opposed to giving me value. I want to block you. So I think uh, the more ad blockers are there and the more consumers we use it, the better it will be. Uh, but I would like to uh, two other kind of quick comments on one in terms of segment of one. The real power here will be by not looking at the consumer just as a target consumer out there, but as a co-creator. And the more the consumer is actually involved in customizing the, the offering and personalization of the method they like, the more will be the value. So I think that we have to move away from the male model that look at the consumer as a target, the consumer as a co-creator. And the more the consumer being as a co-creator with us, the more value they will find from the product. And the final comment only it was triggered actually by uh, your comment on mobile first. I just want to suggest to everyone to, to think about, uh, you think that we have kind of the ultimate uh, kind of um, a smartphone today, I can guarantee you that within five years, the smartphones today will look as obsolete as the old flip uh, kind of Nokia phone from about 10 years ago. The technology is moving so fast, and especially with virtual reality and augmented reality, that the smartphones that of five years from now will not look nothing like what we have today. It will have different type of functionality. So uh, the, the mobile first is going to have a, even more of a major, major impact because you, no person will be around there without this device, without the mobile device. So it's actually how do you separate even the person from the device? I think that's great advice, uh, and you know it's interesting. Uh, you can talk about companies with a purpose, and, and it doesn't change the mental model of still the push environment where we're telling you about our purpose and how great we are. And your concept of the consumer or the audience as the co-creator of the value and the message, I think is an important uh, takeaway. So on that note, I'd like to just give you both a chance to maybe say one or two more things if you want the audience kind of key takeaways that, that you want them to remember. And I'll remind the audience again that if we didn't get to your question, you can send it on to meetings at msi.org uh, email, and uh, we'll forward those on to Jerry and Kat, uh, Catherine, and, and uh, they can follow up. But uh, just any closing thoughts or comments that you want to leave us with? Catherine? 
just to say thanks everyone for uh, for joining and we've had we do have some uh, some of the participants or some of the contributors to the book uh, who are on the call today so thank you so much to you all for um, all the insights that you provided to to make it happen um, it's just the beginning and we really this is the, the next stage is to really um, have these concepts um, uh, experimented with as Jerry emphasized and to gather the learning together and we hope to be a catalyst with you for for a better, more desirable future to address a lot of the challenges that we're, all of the challenges that we're, we're facing um, uh, together. So thank you. I hope that the book and the presentation today will be of value to you as guideline for experimentation. Experiment, 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 and share it with us. So that's the reason this final slide is join the World and Future Advocacy Movement. The way you join by sharing with us your experiments, what worked, what didn't work, and if we create a network of all those who are experimenting in this area, we'll be able to come up with more valuable advertising, more impactful one, and a better world for all. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining, and thanks, Earl, for organizing it. Well, thank you again to both of you for a great presentation and discussion. Um, and I want to let the audience know that our next webinar will be Accountable Marketing, Linking Marketing Actions to Financial Performance, based on the book, uh, by the Marketing Accountability Standards Board that was just recently published. Dave Stewart of Loyal Mount Marymount University uh, will be conducting that webinar. That will be May 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And we look forward to seeing you there. And again, many thanks to the members of the MSI audience for participating in our member-to-member -member webinar series.